In the fourth and fifth lessons, you've seen how the eye works. Now you will hear a bit about the ear. This video looks at the structures and functions of the different parts of the ear, as well as the process of hearing. Again, it is recommended that you draw a diagram of a section through the ear, labeling all of the different parts and giving the functions. Normally, when we talk of the ear in normal English, we refer to these flaps that are on the sides of our head. However, this is just one small part of the larger structure, which is biologically referred to as the ear. I know this particular ear in this picture looks more like a jewelry shop, but we'll look at the biological ear now. So the ear has two main functions. Namely, it is the organ which is responsible for hearing as well as the organ which is responsible for balance. From our normal knowledge, we know that there's this outer flap which is known as the pinna and it has a tiny opening which leads to a passage and then we know about the eardrum. So those structures that all of us probably know about make up what we know as the outer ear. However, after the eardrum, there is another air-filled space that has three tiny bones within it, known as the middle ear. And thereafter, we've got a structure mainly made up of bone that is filled with fluid. And it has the structures responsible for balance as well as for hearing, and that is what makes up the inner ear. So the ear is made up of three distinct regions. To look at it in more detail, the outer ear, we have what we know as the pinna. So this flap on the outside is known as the pinna, and this pinna will send the sound waves into this passage, which is known as the auditory canal. Auditory coming from audio is for sound. It's the auditory canal. You might find certain textbooks referring, it, uh, referring to it as the ear canal. Canal means a passage. We won't accept the word ear canal because there are many other canals and passages within the ear. So the best word would be the auditory canal. Then what we know commonly as the eardrum, the proper scientific term for that is the tympanic membrane. Now the tympanic membrane that's the term we'll be using. It separates the outer ear from the middle ear. So when we get to the middle ear, we find that the middle ear has three tiny bones. You can see I'm emphasizing the word hairs. Right, so these tiny bones are referred to as being ossicles, which literally means very small bones. And the size of these ossicles is so small that all three of them can fit within the tip of your finger. Now, these ossicles, they've got the more scientific name and they've got the common name, which is also accepted within exams. So we're gonna to stick to the common name because it's more easy for us to recall that for examination purposes. The first bone here is referred to as being the hammer because of its shape. The second one is referred to as being an anvil. So an anvil is a structure that was used by blacksmiths when they're working with the iron. And due to the shape being similar to that of an anvil, they refer to it as being the anvil. And the last bone is referred to as being the stirrup. So a stirrup for those people that do horse riding, or if you've seen in the movies, you'll find that the cowboys, they put their foot into this rest, which is known as a stirrup. The shape is almost identical to that of this bone, and that's why it's referred to as the stirrup. So you see that I've emphasized that the middle ear has three bones, has H-A-S. So the order of the bones is H for hammer, then A for anvil, and then S for stirrup. Collectively, 
we know these bones as being the ossicles. This last bone called the stirrup is joined to what we know as the oval window, but we find that the middle ear, it's filled with air also. So the outer ear is filled with air, the middle ear is also filled with air, and it's got this pipe known as the eustachian tube. Okay, the E is silent, you can pronounce it eustachian tube if you wanna make sure that you spell it correctly in exams. Uh, you're gonna find that this eustachian tube now opens up to the nasopharynx. So we know the pharynx at the back of your throat and where the nose meets the mouth passage at the back, there's a tiny opening and that opening leads to the middle ear and this allows air to move in from your throat region into the middle ear. So we said that the stirrup is joined to the oval window and this oval window, it's an oval shape, leads to the structure now where we're now going from the middle ear into the inner ear. Now the inner ear is not filled with air, it's filled with liquid and it's composed of bone. It's got this structure which looks similar to a snail shell, which is known as the cochlea. And that is responsible for hearing. And then it's got two structures for balance. On the top, you can see this, the name is easy, semicircular canals, half circle canals. There are many of them, there are three of them that are in different planes or in different directions. And then we've got something known as the seculus and utriculus, which are found between the semicircular canals and the cochlea in this region here. There's also a structure known as the round window here at the bottom. And the nerves, there's separate nerves coming from the semicircular canal and one from the cochlea. We don't need to know the names in detail, but both of these will join up to what forms the auditory nerve. And this auditory nerve will take the impulses to the brain. So let's look at the functions of the different parts. The pinna will trap sound waves and direct them into the auditory canal. So sound waves coming from different directions or from different sources of the sound will be trapped by the pinna and then directed into the auditory canal. The auditory canal will then transfer the sound waves to the tympanic membrane. We know that the, the, the auditory canal also produces cerumen, which is a wax, and it has hairs which prevent small organisms from entering the ear. The wax also traps dust and dirt, and the wax also maintains the moisture of the tympanic membrane and prevents it from drying out. So the tympanic membrane, it separates the outer and the middle ear, and it will respond respond to sound waves by vibrating. So when sound waves knock against it, it will shake and vibrate. And it will transmit these vibrations to the hammer, which is the first ossicle. Each of the ossicles will transmit the vibration from one to the next. So from the hammer, the vibration goes to the anvil, from the anvil to the stirrup. And we find at the ossicles, the sound is amplified and made louder. We'll speak about that in a bit more detail. So we find that the stirrup then will transmit the vibrations to the oval window. And the oval window is a membrane which will vibrate. And when it vibrates, it causes the fluid within the, the inner ear to be set into motion. And we call this now pressure waves. So there'll be waves in the fluid that will move now. The cochlea, we know it's filled with fluid. It contains the receptor of hearing, which is known as the organ of corti. For examination purposes, we only need to know the name organ of corti. We don't need to know the structural detail of it. And then obviously being a receptor, all receptors receive stimuli and convert them to impulses. The round window will release the pressure created within the Cochlea. So the extra pressure waves are released from the round window. The seculus and utriculus has maculae, which is 
a receptor which is responsible for maintaining balance, one of the receptors, and the semicircular canals also has a receptor known as the cristae, which also assists with maintaining balance. We'll speak about balance in detail in the next video. The auditory nerve will, will carry the impulses for hearing and balance to the cerebrum and cerebellum respectively. So we know that the hearing being sensory input will go to the cerebrum, where it will be interpreted, and the cerebellum will receive the, res the input for balance because that is the part of the brain that is responsible for balance. The eustachian tube, which connects the middle ear to the pharynx, allows air to move in and out of the middle ear and thus maintains equal pressure on either side of the eardrum. Right, so the function of the eustachian tube is to ensure that it will equalize pressure in the middle as well as the outer ear. So at certain times, if for example, a person is in an aircraft and the plane is taking off, as the plane takes off, it increases in altitude and there's a change in pressure. We find that as you go up, pressure decreases. Now what will happen is the outer atmospheric pressure is decreased and the inner ear or the middle ear rather might have the normal atmospheric pressure, which is higher, and this will cause pain in the ear. But if a person opens their mouth, uh, uh, taking in breaths, this can allow air to enter the middle ear and equalize the pressure on both sides of the eardrum. And this will reduce any pain. The process of hearing. When an object makes a sound, it causes waves to move in the air. So these sound waves will move to the pana, be trapped by the pana, and directed into the auditory canal. The auditory canal will carry these sound waves until they reach the tympanic membrane. When the sound waves knock against the tympanic membrane, it causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate, which then in turn causes the hammer to vibrate, the anvil to vibrate, and the stirrup to vibrate. The vibrating of the stirrup against the oval window will cause pressure waves within the fluid of the cochlea. These waves move within the cochlea until it reaches the organ of corti. The organ of corti being the receptor receives these waves converts the stimulus into an impulse and that impulse now will move along the auditory nerve to the cerebrum and the cerebrum will receive and interpret that sound and understand what you have heard. But if you understand how waves occur in a fluid, if you've, you're carrying a bucket with water or a container with water, as you're moving, you'll find that it creates waves. But the wave doesn't just move in one direction. It will move in one direction, knock against the outer boundary of that container, and then come back again and knock on the other side. And again, so the waves will continue moving for a while until it settles. So if that's happening in your inner ear, it's going to lead to an echo. You're going to hear the same sound again. So that wave that is now within the cochlea then moves to the round window. And at the round window, the round window will vibrate and remove that excess pressure wave from the inner ear. So that is the process of hearing. You can see that if you know the structures and the functions, it makes hearing quite easy because you just start on the left-hand side and you move from the pana to the auditory canal, tympanic membrane, each of the ossicles, oval window, cochlea, organ of corti, and then auditory nerve to the cerebrum. So to repeat that or to re-emphasize it, this diagram being a flow chart can be easy for us to remember, but again, in an exam situation, you'd now fill in the other words to make up full sentences. So the sound waves will come from the outside environment, be trapped by the pana, move, 
through the auditory canal to the tympanic membrane. So you'll see we speak about sound waves only in the outer ear we refer to sound waves. Once we get to the middle ear, the tympanic membrane now vibrates. We no longer talk about sound waves, we talk about vibrations. And the vibration is transferred from the hammer to the anvil to the stirrup. And now the oval window will vibrate and it's amplified now. And once we get now to the inner ear, which is the cochlea, we no longer speak about sound waves, we no longer speak about vibrations, we speak about pressure waves now. So these pressure waves move within that fluid until it reaches the organ of corti, which will convert the stimuli into impulses. And these impulses go via the auditory nerve to the brain, specifically the cerebrum, and the cerebrum will understand what you've heard. And so amplification, we find that decreasing size of the structures as you move towards the inner ear causes amplification, causes the sound to become louder. We're gonna look at a video that will now show this a bit more clearly. The most significant increase in pressure is caused by pneumatic amplification. The face of the stapes has a surface area of about 3.2 square millimeters, while the eardrum has a surface area of 55 square millimeters. Using this, along with leverage through the malleus and incus, the final pressure is 22 times greater than when the sound first arrived. From that first video, you would have realized that two things were visible. Okay, one was that as the vibrations were passing from the tympanic membrane through the ossicles into the inner ear, you're finding that as the oval window is moving, the round window is also moving, which is taking out the extra pressure waves. But the emphasis in that video was that the size of the eardrum is many times larger than the size of the oval window. So since the tympanic membrane is larger than the oval window, it results in the amplification of the sound. This next video, we'll look at the process of hearing once again. You know, sound waves will cause the tympanic membrane to vibrate. You can see here the hammer vibrating, anvil vibrating, and the stirrup vibrating. And this will now cause the oval window to vibrate. And within the cochlea, we're gonna find that there is fluid. So the movement of the oval window now causes pressure waves. We're talking of movement of the fluid. And then the organ of corti is made up of tiny hair cells. And that movement of the fluid causes certain hair cells to move. And those hair cells moving will then now cause a change. And that stimulus is converted into an impulse. Okay, so that impulse from the organ of corti will move on the auditory nerve until it reaches your brain and your brain will understand the sound you've heard. Right, so that brings us to the end of this video. To recap what we've looked at, we've looked at the structure of the ear. We've done all of the labels as well as the functions of the different parts. And then we went through the process of hearing Within the process of hearing, we've also looked at the process of amplification. We've also spoken about the equalization of pressure on both sides of the eardrum, which is brought about by the structure known as the eustachian tube. The next video will continue looking at the ear, but we'll be looking now at the process of balance and how balance is maintained by the structures within the inner ear. We'll also look at certain disorders with the ear.